According to Dr. Ben, the original name of Africa was Alkebalon. Africa, the whole continent, was also called Ethiopia. As a matter of fact, the Atlantic Ocean was called the Ethiopian Sea. So there were several different names. Africa was really described by different tribes. It wasn't a whole monolithic society, but eventually they named Africa after a European. Africa was not called Africa. It's actually named after the one who actually conquered uh, the uh, Carthaginian Scipio Africanus. So they usually, the Roman, uh, Roman uh, types of system is that the conquering general gets to name the region he conquered. He gets his name to be placed on that region. So Scipio Africanus is, is they, you know, they, they named a certain terrain after him. So everybody just said, well, let's call it Africa or Africanus. But if you look to uh, Dr. Ben's work, you'll find that it was called Kush, and you'll find it was called Alkibulan. It had many names, Ethiopia, which Ethiop, which is essentially Greek, but a whole continent was once known as Ethiopia. It's terrible, you know, about just where math came from. You know, all of the pictures that they've shown out of Africa, they've never really educated the Americans, white or black, about what really goes on in Africa, what some of the cities are really like. And that we're not running around over there with Tarzan, you know, and when they show anything from Africa, even down to today, they pick the worst scenes, the most terrible situations, you know, and uh, they show those, but, uh, we have a proud history, but of course, what we did in Egypt 5,000 years ago, or what we did in China 35,000 years ago, is of no benefit if we don't understand what to do today and how that would help us to survive. And we discovered the clock. We did discover the wheel. We were, black man has never been a caveman. You've never been in the cave. There's no history of it. You've ever been in a cave. Uh, we discovered mathematics and uh, the alphabet and writing and all of those great things that they have built a foundation on that they came and got and took back to other countries. We don't know what Africa would be like without the white influence. We don't know what it would be like without the Rockefellers and De Beers and all of them. We don't know what Africa would have been like. We do know that there were greater places in Africa other than Egypt, which is the only one they let us know about. Concurrently and simultaneously during the Pyramid Age, there are great things happening in West Africa. But we very seldom. There are nations known as Dartichet. Dartichet is now, would geographically presently be located where Ghana is. We had the Nak culture, which is where we today would call Nigeria. We have the Monomotapan Empire in what today we call Zimbabwe. There, there are over 300 stone structures in southern Africa. And then you have that great structure in, in the great Zimbabwe that shows a direct relationship to the Grand Lodge of Luxor in Egypt. You have Puanit, which is in today's Somalia, Ethiopia. You have the, the Kush empires that are simultaneously happening. When Hatshepsut, the great pharaoh king, although she was a woman, she was a pharaoh king, sitting on the throne of Kemet, her cousin sits on the throne of Puanit, or what we call Somalia. There are great things happening historically across the African continent. You have the kingdoms of Kuba and Luba in Central Africa. Mansa Musa was the king of Mali in the, the 1300s, very wealthy brother. During the dark age of Europe, Europe was going through a dark age, Africa was thriving. It was the gold capital. Mansa Musa was considered the wealthiest man on the planet at the time. Mansa Musa had a very well-known pilgrimage to Mecca where he went to, to Egypt and went to Mecca and went through Egypt and he gave out so much gold it threw off the Egyptian economy. In today's terms, Mansa Musa gave away what would be the equivalent of a hundred million dollars in gold. The African was the first race to circumnavigate the entire globe. All over Africa, all over the world, the peoples of color that they call Africans, Alkibalanians, we were all over the world. So to say that in, 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 Ghana, the, in Ghana, they had the Ashanti, uh, they had, I mean, all over, we had powerful, um, uh, dynasties so innumerable we couldn't even name them because remember we had hundreds of thousands of years and that's the secret they cut us off at 6,000 because anything beyond that they could say is mystery they could say is myth so when you control the information which is essentially what they've learned to do under the Vatican they have about six to eight miles of storage space that have all of our artifacts and uh, the Virgin Mother being black, all of the faces, 
we have to take apart the layers that are actually uh, constructed in the lie. They are layered. For instance, you have a discipline in academia called Egyptology. Now, what is Egyptology? They say, well, it's the study of Egypt. Well, no, it's not the study of Egypt. Egyptology was created by the Vatican in order to make sure that there was a screening mechanism in place to explain away the truth that was being excavated every year that kept giving them proof of who the ancient Chemites were. So Egyptology and Egyptologists are essentially agents of disinformation. Where else do you see a society, a people, and a way of life actually become a science? Unless you have specific purposes to make sure that the information that you are gathering on those people are given the proper perspectives to maintain the lie. So you don't get an Americology, you don't get Europology, you don't get Russiaology. Richard Pryor, right, when he had his special back in 1977, there's a scene. They only allowed him to do five shows. In fact, they were rather ignorant because it took him five shows to realize what the brother was really doing. Richard Pryor, there's a scene where he goes in uh, to the pyramids and he is carrying the bags of the archaeologists and the anthropologists who are of European descent. And they're talking amongst themselves about what this find is and its importance, the greatness of it. And Richard Pryor is in the, this temple uh, looking all around and he begins to say, but all these people are black. He said, look at that guy over there, that guy, that guy look like my uncle. And he's just, you know, I mean, it's humorous, but what Richard Pryor is actually talking about is that, you know, these are black people in these pyramids, and these are the people that built these pyramids. He said, wait a minute, these people... And then all of a sudden, the, the camera begins to show the anthropologists of European descent, and they start to nudge each other because they realize, hey, you know, the guy carrying the bags is looking around, and he's learning some things in here. So very quietly, you see them backing out of the pyramid. Right, and Richard Pryor is still there talking about how great the pyramid is, and then all of a sudden, you, they show you the door close, and all of a sudden, the scene goes black. Which means that was the blackout on the information for black folk to understand their history. This is what Richard Pryor was dropping on us in 1977. This is what actually has happened. Richard was telling us this is what has happened to us because as, as you become conscious and brother becomes conscious, and as a community, we become conscious, the Europeans who know this are beginning to realize. So they're trying to shut the door on us. African people established the first dynasties in Asia. Um, you, when you look at old paintings of um, Eastern Asian people, you can see the, the African ancestry in, the, in their features. The Japanese were formed when Ethiopians brought South Koreans onto the island and combined with the original people there known as the Ainu. The Ainu now, you're going to find the Ainu in the Philippines. They're going to be called Negritos. You're going to find them in Vietnam. They're called the Champa or the Mountain Yards. You're going to find African people throughout the Far East. Very dark complexion, very curly hair, wide nose, thick lip. You will also find those with straight hair. You will find those with a more aquiline nose. Some of the first Buddha statues clearly had African features, classical African features. If you go to Thailand, if you go to Korea, if you go to Vietnam, you will see some of these statues up that has, has the classical African nose, classical African lips, woolly hair. When we go to Asia, we see that the founder of the samurai warrior, okay, in Japan, all right, was an African. We found that the uh, founders of the ninja system was an African. In fact, in Japan, there's a saying that if you don't have a little bit of African blood, you can never truly be a samurai. Martial arts was established by a black Dravidian who was living in southern India by the name of Bodaharma. Now Bodaharma, it was said that he walked from southern India into to Asia, China, and on his way there, he would study the fighting mechanisms of animals and he used that as a form of self-defense for himself, and that's where martial arts started. There was another guy named Tigui, 
who was a, an original master of martial arts. And if you look at old paintings of Tigua, this dude looks like Lionel Richie. So martial arts was really established in Africa. Even during slavery in Brazil, there's a form of Brazilian martial arts, which is African martial arts called capoeira. And what they would do, the, the African slaves would practice this form of martial art and they would disguise it as dancing. When we look at the early pictures of most of the deities of Asia, nearly all of them bore striking resemblance to the deity, deities of the now Bali civilizations. And even in their writings, you will see that even in Asia, not just Greece and Rome, but even in Asia, you see them paying tribute paying tribute to the spiritual systems and history that they had learned in Africa. In fact, the Asian spiritual system is probably the closest approximate to the traditional African spiritual system. From the one, you get many, with the creator being manifested in all living organisms, be it a tree or a human being. That is fundamental to Asian thought, but it's also fundamental to African thought, which predated Asia. When you go into these jungles in Bangkok and the areas of Vietnam, when uh, the Vietnamese, when they were fighting in Vietnam, they went into these temples, they saw nothing but these African faces. When they saw the black man dressed up like that, they thought that the, the Buddha gods had come back. All these black men dressed in these American uh, uh, faces, they were accustomed in the bush to these black faces, these black Buddhas. And when you go deeper into that information, you're only seeing black faces. You can go down into certain parts of Africa or down there, I forgot the name of the tribes, but in the Bantu, you could look at them and they have very high cheeks and their eyes are completely slanted. So you can tell where the Chinese people actually ascended from. It's just been awful how they've did us on religion. And our people tend to think that even those who feel that they know that white Americans have mistreated us, their grandchildren or great-grandchildren, still mistreating us in a lot of ways. They still believe where, but nobody would lie about God, when that's not true. People who are trying to subjugate another people and turn them into slaves, not just physically, but mentally, then uh, they certainly would try to uh, teach them that God looks like me. A lot of people say it doesn't matter what Jesus looked like, it doesn't matter what God looked like or other deity, but the thing is if it did not matter what Jesus looked like, why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of Jesus look like? Why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of the disciples look like? Because that's very important to know if it doesn't matter. Michelangelo was told by the Pope to put the picture of the Holy Family on the, on, on the roof of the chapel. Michelangelo said he that and the Pope specifically told him to make it European. Michelangelo explained to him that there are no models of a European holy family. And so he said, you'll think of something, and he did. He used his, his family. We thought the only guy we had was the one that white people gave us, which was Jesus, okay? And he looked like them. And uh, when we saw them, psychologically, we were transferred that that was deity. If it really was unimportant what he looked like, then why didn't he look like some of the other, the majority of the people on earth? Why would he look like the people who are the minority race on the entire earth? We're not the minority. People always ask me, why do the black church not get rid of the white Jesus and put a blue black Jesus in place with a nappy head? Because black people would stop going. Not only did they hide the color of religious figures throughout Europe, they would hide the colors of other very important people, especially royalty in Europe. A lot of old paintings in Europe, they clearly show African looking deities. They show the black Madonna and child. This is all throughout Europe. They show black pictures of Jesus. They show African looking disciples all over Europe. In everything that you're looking at in the, the Roman Catholic Church today is the exact copy of what they got from Egypt. The high priests, the regular priests, you got the cardinals, you got the bishops, and then you got the, got the pope at top. So you had the pharaoh, you had the high priest, you had the priests, and so you have the same type of, of categorization of people as, they, as they're placed in the temple, but their purposes and what they were telling was different. When racism rose, because racism was a system, and prior to the system of racism evolving as a necessary instrument for the maintenance and protection of the European genotype, Europeans, for many intents and purposes, 
I would say just about worshiped African people. First three popes were black. You had one named Saint Victor, you had one named Saint Gelasius, you had one pope named Saint Matthias. There was another brother named Saint Benedict, who was a, a patron saint in Europe, well known throughout Italy. Militatus was a black pope. Militatus was the pope during um, the Council of Nicaea. And we've had these brothers who were worshiped throughout Europe and Italy, and we don't talk about it in America, but they're well known in Europe. You, you have one brother, Saint Maurice, who's a, a, a well-known martyr in a, and a religious figure throughout Europe, and you see his statues all over the place. Many of those who early on helped to formulate what is modern-day Christianity in Greece and Rome were also African. When you look at Christianity, you're dealing with the Amen priesthood that's coming directly out of uh, ancient Kemet. You're dealing with the rites and rituals of Osiris, the passions of Osiris, the idea of the resurrection of the dead and his son coming forward, Heru, as his living testament to his life. Aset, who the Greeks call Isis, is the, the, um, the, the essence of who Mary is. Um, Nebetet, who is her sister, is who Mary Magdalene is. So that when you look at Christianity, I mean, even when you look at the word uh, Chris or Karast, you're dealing with Kares, Ka means spirit and Res means to rise. The Romans learned your, the passion of Osiris through the Greek. And the Greeks learned it through the Chemites or the Africans from Egypt. So that it was just a, a retelling of the same story, superimposing things that they thought they knew. And that becomes what we today call uh, Christianity. Judaism, that is Atenism. That comes directly out, out of the, the, the river, uh, Hapi or Nile. And uh, that is why Moses himself was said to be uh, initiated into the priesthood of ancient Egypt. In fact, today, if you were to go to Africa and talk to the children who've been Christianized, they will tell you that their ancestors covenanted with devils. And this is why black people are in the condition they are today. So turn to Christianity, and of course, you turn to the, to the, to the oppressor's religion, and then you, you eat the gruel that they give you, and at the bottom it says, Jesus saved you. Of course, you're conditioning that person for another thousand years. The falsehood of Christianity has taken a toll on black relationships because really when, when women are taught, or in women and men, but when you're taught as a female that God and Jesus is white, you're going to look at whites as a, somewhat of a savior figure. And you're gonna look at the, the men in your life a little differently. Try to just work on that more. We need to stop going to church every Sunday trying to get along with them and try to get along with the people at home. Some people leave home mad, but they go to church and go in there and then they love the pastor and they love Jesus because there's no accountability. Jesus ain't gonna say, pull your dress down, come in off the street, go clean up the house. You know, Jesus ain't gonna tell them that. And if he do, they ain't gonna listen to that. There is only one race on the planet and that is the human race. And because of biological climatology, this race was born, nurtured, sustained, civilized, educated in Africa. And Dr. Clark teaches us that after they got their show together, then they took it on the road. The origin of the name Europe comes from a Phoenician goddess named Europa. So the origin of the name Europe has an African origin because the Phoenicians, we're still dealing with, with black African people, the Canaanites and all that. When we talk about Phoenicians, we're still talking about black folks. The first Europeans were a group of Africans called the Grimaldi who had migrated from Africa to Europe between 40 and 60,000 years ago. And in the process of evolution, many of them lost the Africoid genotype and phenotypical features and then went on to look more European-esque. You even see in pre-racist Europe, Africans and Europeans are living side by side. In fact, a lot of European families have a African background that they don't like to acknowledge. Queen Charlotte, she was a, a woman of African descent and this is well known throughout Europe. Um, there was another guy, King Charles. Many people say that he has uh, an African origin as well, that he has African ancestry. Um, he, King Charles was referred to as the black boy growing up because he was so dark. And they have pubs over in Europe now called the Black Boy Pub or the Black Boy Inn, which refers to King Charles. Um, there is also 
knowledge about King Charles being a descendant of the De Medici family. The De Medici family out of Europe, out of Italy, they're known to have that African bloodline as well. One of the De Medici's, Alessandro De Medici, who was a, a ruler in Italy, you look at pictures of him, this dude looks like Ryan Leslie. So you could see that African bloodline running through a lot of these people of royal descent. There were blacks in Scotland. There was um, one black Scottish king named Kenneth the Dub. There are um, figurines of, and carvings of black Scots. The Celtic Druids was the African priesthood that had gone into Europe and had inhabited the islands of what we today call Ireland, inhabited what we today call uh, so-called Great Britain, Scotland and Wales. They, it, it inhabited Holland, inhabited Denmark, was all up in there. Many Greeks and Romans were biracial, to use a modern term, which they didn't use exactly. back then. They were biracial. True. Their look, okay, could not readily on the surface be absolutely identified as European or black because many of them was of a biracial stock. Hannibal Barker, the great uh, military genius, he comes from an African background. In a lot of movies and on television shows, they will try to Europeanize and whiten up the image of Hannibal Barker. But he was definitely a man of African descent. Um, there are even coins throughout um, Europe and North Africa of Hannibal showing him. Many historians say that there's a coin of a, a black man and there's an elephant on the other side and people say that that is Hannibal. Yes, Hannibal Barkas was um, one of the greatest warriors that ever lived. And what he did, what he accomplished, um, was is now still uh, a, a, a matter of study in all of the world's uh, military colleges. Uh, what he did by bringing together, he had the power to bring different factions together. He had different, uh, the, the, um, the Celts, he had uh, the African uh, horsemen, he had different types of uh, armies. So when he went against Rome, they didn't know who to fight because there were so many different styles of warfare. And when you had such a genius and a brilliant man at 22, actually orchestrating after his father, of course, taught him everything that he knew, brought him on campaigns to teach him. He came back and actually took his father's uh, genius to the next level. Septimus Severus was African and he was the one that actually took the fight, uh, took the Roman fight up north into England. The, the Russian language that we know today can be attributed to a black man named Alexander Pushkin. He created the modern Russian language because they were speaking French and other types of language there. Had it not been for someone like Alexander Pushkin, Russians would be speaking French today. A lot of people say that people like Leonardo da Vinci and Sir Isaac Newton, they created a lot of inventions in Europe, but a lot of their inventions can be attributed to the African presence that was in Europe because there was a strong African presence and they were bringing in science and mathematics, so that's where all that came from. Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, you know, all of them studied with African people. They didn't come up with this. And I, when, when, when people talk about Leonardo da Vinci, the only question that I have as it relates to Leonardo da Vinci is who was his teacher? Who taught Leonardo da Vinci uh, brain anatomy? Who taught him about the airplane? Who taught him this? Tell me who was his teacher? They can't tell you who the teacher is because if they told you who the teacher is, they would have to tell you they were black. Marco Polo, he was considered to be one of the first Europeans to make it over into Eastern Asia. And what Marco Polo did, he took something known as the Silk Road into Asia. And the Silk Road was already established by Africans and other Aboriginal people. And the Silk Road, they would travel this road and they would trade garments. And this is why Italy has always been known to be a, a fashion mecca. People always talk about the quality of Italian clothes. But when we talk about Italian fashion, where did they get that fashion sense from? See, the Italians got that fashion sense from the Moors and the Africans that went in there. They brought those silk garments and, and all those fly clothes into Europe. Even the, the concept of alligator shoes, which is attributed to Italy. The thing is, alligators are not indigenous to Italy. Crocodiles are not indigenous to Italy. So where did they get those alligator skins and those crocodile skins? They got those from Africa. The Moors brought that in, and the players wear shoes called Maori Gators. Those are some of the most popular shoes around uh, among players, the Maori Gators. The word Maori is a variation of the word Moorish. So we have to know all this stuff.
All that is our stuff. That's African stuff. If you look at art, art tends to follow a certain type of a zeitgeist, a certain type of a mindset. People tend not to just wake up and paint one picture in America that looks identical to a picture that was painted in Africa thousands of years ago. Okay, and so whenever you see a piece of art, you can best believe that it was inspired by something that was seen prior to. In fact, when you look at some of the great European artists, okay, uh, Van Gogh, and all of these types of guys, you will see a lot of their art was inspired by the so-called dark art of West Africa. There has been studies that have put the pieces of Van Gogh and others up next to pieces of traditional African cultural art in West Africa. That art that would be considered a negative, underworldly, dark and demonic. But the great European artists copied what was considered by Europe some of the lowest and most primitive forms of artwork that went on to be considered some of the most successful by them. Another very important African figure in Europe was a black man by the name of Angelo Solomon. He was a guy, he, um, he was a, a Moor, he was a celebrity in Europe, in Austria. Um, he was also known as the father of pure Masonic thought because he was a Mason as well. And this guy, when he died, they literally stuffed his body. They skinned him and stuffed his body and they would have him on display at certain places. So he was a very important figure in Europe. Suleiman taught Mozart. Who's Suleiman? Suleiman's a, a Moor, he's an African. Who's Beethoven? Beethoven was Thoven Bey. He was a Moor. His mother was a Moor. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he went deaf, uh, that melanin kicked in. The inner eye kicked in. He heard music that better when he was deaf than he heard it otherwise. There's also another um, uh, myth that he cut the webbing of his hand down to the bone so that he can get a better stretch. So there's some of the 32nd chords that he has. He plays and most people can't play. They need like two people playing. That's why some people, in certain instances, you see two people playing Beethoven. Two pianos playing Beethoven. That's because of what he did when he stretched his finger. Beethoven was called a Moor when he was growing up. Um, Beethoven, there's a book about him called Beethoven's Hair because people were so infatuated with the texture of his hair. So that, that African bloodline runs real deep throughout Europe. And again, he was called a Moor and the Moors were very important throughout Europe. And it's funny, the importance of the Moor was so deep in Europe, but we rarely hear about them in history books today. You see reference to Moors throughout African history. You see reference to Moors over here in American history. The Moors were African men who went into Europe around 711 AD and they really civilized Europe because Europe was going through a dark age. Europe was really struggling because after the Vandals had, had basically destroyed Rome, everything was backwards over there. So the Moors went in and they, they ushered in the Renaissance era. They brought in science, mathematics, astrology, they brought all of this into Europe. Uh, they are bringing in hot and cold running water. They are being, uh, bringing in concepts of what we call a cosmopolitan city. They are lighting the streets uh, by lamps uh, in Cordova. You know, they, they build an entire city where the streets for miles you could walk with lamps that lit the street at night. And they had raised sidewalks where people could walk. The kings and queens of Europe lived in barns. Nobody wants to admit that. But they lived in barns. They lived with the animals. And another thing that the Africans brought in was that they said, you know, you cannot let your chicken run, run around in your house and them cows got to go outside. So they created what's called corrals. And corral is an Ethiopian word. It's a K-R-A-L sound. Corral, which is where they would put their animals after they domesticated them. Europeans let them animals run all up and down. This is where the German measles come from. This is where chicken pox come from because Europeans did not have a place for their animals. They just ran all up inside their places and they would carry, as they would get illnesses and sicknesses, they did not bathe, so therefore they had no soap, they had no disinfectant, didn't have alcohol, so that this type of style of living brought illness. When the Moors came in, they, they wrapped all that up along with bringing medicine. What you have happening is that these Gothic kingdoms are gonna bring down, they're gonna sack the Roman Empire. And after they sack the Roman Empire, they're going to take this area over for a while. And then the Moors are going to come in and they're going to push 
those Visigoths out and they're going to push them more north and they're going to chase them out of the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. And that's where the Moors are going to inhabit from 710 until 1492, January 2nd to be exact, when the last great king, uh, Boabdil, uh, was uh, chased out of Granada. The term Moor started to, to become interchangeable with the term black because it was basically the same thing. But when the slave trade started, they tried to objectify um, black people, Moorish people. So they would use the term interchangeably and they would just switch on to calling people black. But if you look at a lot of old documents, there's even sh slave ships called Blackamoor. If you look at slave records, there was even a boxer out of Virginia who was very popular in the early 1800s named Tom Molyneux and his nickname was The Moor. So that name was definitely used interchangeably with black or Negro at that time. Moor means black, like Negro, Ethiopian. Moor means black. Moor is not a people. Moor is a color. And they have taken this word Moor and they have associated Moor with Muslim. There were Moors that weren't Muslim. Moor means black. There were Christian Moors. There were Moors that, that practiced a traditional African faith system. So that Moor means black, simple. When the Moors went into Europe, they changed the uh, appearance of the population. Do you see? So you have Italians, Spaniards being darker than the Scandinavians. A Scandinavian person told me that they never considered the Italians or Jewish people to be white. Do you see, because the lighter people are further north. When I went to Europe, I would always look at pictures and I would always see a moor and sometimes I would see like a skull and bones. And many of the moors would have a skull and bones flag. That's what pirates are known for. There were many Moorish pirates. There was even a Barbary War where they were, um, the U.S. was fighting Moorish pirates up in North Africa in the Barbary Coast. And there's even a secret organization called the Skull and Bones. And we know that masonry comes from Moorish science. So there's always a connection there with the Moors. And it's important that as we begin to develop an understanding of this society that it's, it's not Freemason as we know it. And that the Moors brought in this knowledge into Europe. Africans brought this knowledge into Europe. And in bringing this knowledge into Europe, the Knights Templars and other organizations were born out of this. And peoples of European descent were exposed to alchemy, okay? The periodic table of elements, the laboratory, how to take information, how to take elements and atoms and to begin to manipulate them to make them into different types of molecules. The basic one is hydrogen, two hydrogen is helium, Three hydrogen is lithium, six is carbon, eight is oxygen. So you, so, so you have this alchemy that's going to come and they're going to begin to study, they're going to begin to learn, they're going to become, they're, they're going to create societies that's going to develop an understanding. This is going to be what eventually is going to become Freemasonry because only a select group of people in Europe is going to be exposed to this information. But the secret of Masonry of who we really are, the Moors that's being here on this land, this particular land because it was called, in many names, you had Turtle Island that we called it, or Tula, or El Morocco, the different terms that we had. And the original map of America was written by a guy named Idrisi. Mm. The original map was written in um, Sanskrit. And Attica was actually mapped by a moor. And most people don't know it was mapped by a moor. And they have old topographical evidence of old maps of Antarctica. That's why the Nazis fled there because they knew that there were places there under the ice that they could actually inhabit and hide. We know for a fact that the, that the first Umayyad and Abbasid dynasty, we know they were black. We know that they were what we call Arabs, but there's no such thing as an Arab. An Arab, I call them Afrabs, because to be an Arab, you must be black. That's what makes you an Arab, that you're black. The term Arab, that's a, a loose term. Arab doesn't really identify nationality or race because there are Moors who are Arabs, there were Moors who were Christians. 
So the word more, a lot of people try to make more synonymous with light or white skin, but that's not necessarily the case because you remember even when Barack Obama was, was trying to get elected in America, when people tried to slander him, they would say, oh, he's an Arab. So people know that an Arab, is, it really means non-white, but they try to make the term interchangeable. They switch the term up at their disposal. So that even if you did want to say Arabs, they're not Eurasians, they're mixtures of Eurasians and Africans that would congregate in certain areas once they came out of the Ice Age, and then they would come across, they would travel uh, west into <clears throat> what we call North Africa, but they would not come in any large numbers until thousands of years after the fact. We know that Tariq was an African. He was the general that crossed over in July of 711 into, into what we call Spain today. It wasn't called Spain then, it didn't exist. These were little kingdoms, a king of Spain called Alphonse X, very smart man. What he did was he began to translate the works out of Arabic. Now, Arabic is an African language, by the way. And Antara was the one that gave it syntax and grammar. Because prior to what we today call Islam, Arabic didn't exist. Arabic was the language of the Quran. And that came out of Africans, that Spanish and French and Portuguese Italian, Romanian, these languages would, would codify themselves once the Moors came in and brought civilization and brought in a semblance of language and syntax. They then would take Latin and they would branch off and then you would have Spanish. That's why all of the languages are related to Latin. That's why they call the Latin languages. A lot of the European royal family's coat of arms, you can clearly see depictions of Moors. Many of the original castles of Europe were built by the Moors. Um, there are many Moorish castles in Spain, Italy, England, and some of these castles, they can be seen in Africa as well. A lot of people don't know that there are castles all throughout Ethiopia. We never see that on television. We always see the cats and the, the dudes in the mud huts and people starving in Ethiopia, but there are very well-designed castles all over Ethiopia and a lot of the Moors, you can see pictures and paintings of them in castles in Europe. You can look at old paintings and see this. What you are looking at when you see the cathedrals, cathedrals, that's all Moorish architecture, taken to the extent to the next level. In fact, we know for a fact, and I have to get this specific book once more, but all of the cathedrals that you see built in England, the, the, uh, the island of England, were built by the Moors. By the time the Moors got into Europe, the illiteracy rate was very high because there was no practical reason for people to read at the time because people were really trying to survive. So the only people who could read at the time were monks or religious figures. So the Moors went into to Europe and they started to establish universities. The first university created in Europe, the University of Salamanca, uh, they created the education system that Europe adopted. They brought in what became classical music. Um, they're the ones who uh, brought architecture and fineries. In fact, it, it was so advanced that the teachers in the Moorish uh, paradigm during their, in the Iberian Peninsula, the teachers under the Moors got the equivalent of $40,000 a year back then. That's how advanced they were. In fact, everywhere in Europe sent their best to go and learn there, just like they sent them to Timbuktu, just like they sent them over to, um, to Luxor, just like they sent them over to where all these areas where you see Africans and high sciences were, they sent them there to Spain to learn. Well, the, the Moors brought in the first music conservatory into Valencia, Spain. They brought Ziriab into Spain and he brought in a chordophone known as the lud, L apostrophe O U D. We call it lute, L U T E. It's a chordophone, and it, it has four chords. And you know the uh, hormones of the body, the humors. Uh, Africans would heal people when you had clogs in your liquid systems. Okay, whether it was your mucus, or whether it was your hormones, whether it was your phlegm, whether it was your blood. Whatever was clogged up, what they do is that they would put this, this chordophone over your body and they would strum, right? And in strumming, the vibration of the string would open up whatever was clogged, okay? Ziriab, in his brilliance, added a fifth string. And this fifth string was for plasma. 
which is invisible liquid, which is the origin of the universe. And this just healed your entire system, your entire body. When you look at a piano, a piano is a harp turned sideways. That's why when you look at a, a, a baby grand piano, it, it's shaped like a harp. Then you take the top up and you put a stick there so that it's open, right? So that Africans said that instead of strumming strings to make the sound, what they would do is they would put it to its side, encase it in wood, and then you would hit keys. And the keys then would hit the strings and it would be a different kind of sound. And so when, when, when you're looking at uh, Baroque music, which Bach is really given credit for developing, that came out of Africa. Okay, Africa. In fact, Africans have the finger piano that, that, you know, that they play. All they did was take the concept of the finger piano, the xylophone, and this harp turned sideways, and that became piano. Out of that came what we call classical music. And this is why when I hear African folk talk about, because I enjoy classical music. I play classical music, I enjoy listening to classical music, but that's black music, that's soul music. And black folk used classical music as soul music, but, but Europeans took it. And so now when we look at what we call classical music, Tchaikovsky or, or Beethoven or Mozart or any of the so-called classical pianists or classical musicians, we say, oh man, that's white music. That's not white music. We don't know our history. Blackamore jewelry is this very expensive jewelry that's sold throughout Europe among wealthy people. And it's jewelry that shows black people in, in gold, diamonds. It's this very elaborate, beautiful jewelry with African people. And it's very popular in Europe. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, when they, you know, ended the Moorish conquering in Europe. And at that point, that's when the bullfighting started as a game, and I say the symbolism in the bullfights. You know, like you have the matador in his suit of lights, and he is spending his time getting ready to kill the black bull, which I say represents the Africans. And so they even have the running of the bulls today, where you have Spaniards dressed in white clothes, Run, you know, running but being chased in the past it used to be mostly black bulls would be chasing them. And so I say that symbolism related to the, what, seven or eight hundred years when the Moors had conquered Spain and then the whites defeated the Moors and pushed them back into Africa. But it's being played out, the fear of the black bull, meaning the black male. And in response, the game ends when the bull is killed. You know, when we were growing up, we would always see the toy monkey that you can wind up and it had the cymbals and, or it had drums and you wind it up and it would clap. If you look at the way that monkey is dressed, the monkey would usually have on a vest, a fez. There are even some paintings of the monkey wearing a turban. So when you see the turban, we we're talking about Moors. When you see black folks with turbans. so. People know who the Moors are. You know the racial epithet that black folks look like monkeys. That monkey with the Moorish garb on, that's a way of them kind of low-key insulting black folks without us knowing our, our origin because they know who we are. We don't know who we are. The reason why we don't understand Native American history, we don't understand the African presence in America, we don't understand culture is because when we study in our textbooks in America the presence of Native American people, we study the 13 colonies. And then we got this Westwood Ho thing going on, where we now are, are, are meeting the indigenous people as the European met the indigenous people. But if you want to study indigenous peoples, you have to study the Mississippi River because the Mississippi River was to indigenous people what the Nile River was, or the Happy River was, to African people. It was go back to a book called The Life of Columbus, written by John Boyd Thatcher in 1905. He wrote in three volume set, where he chronicles this man we call Columbus. Cristobal Colon was a very shrewd individual. He was Spanish, and he was Jewish. He was Sephardim. And he is involved in, in, in traveling to Africa with the Moors in the 1400s. We, we find him on the coast of West Africa, between West Africa and the Canary Islands in 1482. He's involved in the enslavement trade. 
with the Portuguese. That's why the great majority of Africans that find themselves in this part of the world, the great majority of them are in Brazil. For every 100 Africans stolen from Africa, 38 of those 100 are in Brazil. Brazil is the largest African community outside of the African continent. So he was already in Africa. He came from West Africa. He was in West Africa when he found out that the Africans had a way to get to this point. In fact, from southern parts of Africa towards the mid-continent, there was a way to get to America in half the time because there was a current called the River Jordan. That wasn't his first time here. He came in many times before that. Really? And understood that he were here on this land. See, you got to remember, he didn't never come up to North America. He went right. to the South America, he never st stepped foot up here. And when you study his, uh, I think it's his son's records, his son will actually tell you about these things. His son will tell you who was on the ship and how he saw the same people he saw in Africa over here on this land, and they were Moors. Pedro Alonso Nino, he was the one of the chief navigators who came over to America with Christopher Columbus. And many people say if it wasn't for the Moors being on those ships with Columbus, they would have never found the new world of America. There, there's evidence of of many Africans that are on those three ships and the other ships that would be because Cristobal didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the Native American peoples. Even the Spaniards would bring Estevanico, an African, to Spain and he is the one that's going to cross over Florida through Arizona, through, the, uh, through that southern uh, west and befriend indigenous people because he was a healer. Africans have been going back and forth engaging in cultural trade and other forms of economic trade way before there was any mention of anyone by the name of Columbus. So his voyage was nothing new for a human being to make. It may have been new for a European, but it was definitely not new for the African. We had already been doing it. In fact, there's maps in some of the museums around the world that show how those involved in the maritime trade would actually get from West Africa. The Piri Reyes map was a map that was found by a Turkish explorer named Piri Reyes and the map comprised of longitude and latitude which was not discovered by Europeans yet and the map comprised of different ancient maps from, from Arabia and um, Egypt. These maps showed that there was a, a North and South American continent. It's Africans have already been to America thousands of years. We, we can track the 18th dynasty of Egypt on the Mississippi River. So we know that there are Africans in America, they are coming back and forth between Africa and America frequently, working together with the indigenous peoples here. And in fact, the indigenous people themselves are now African. That's why when a European came here, he called the indigenous people the red man. You don't get to be red without some brown and black. When the Jesuit priests from Spain and Portugal came over to the Americas and they wrote back, they would classify the Native Americans, in many cases, as Negro. What we know as Memphis, as the capital of ancient Kemet, was over here in the West. Mm. See, most people don't know that. And that all of the stories from Cortez, as he states in his book, and all of the diaries of Balboa right. and them all came, all actually said that they, were, they came into and were confronted with African peoples, especially of the Mali dynasties. When you're looking at the original American people, the Olmec people are a mixture. You're basically going to see them being born in what we call the Gulf of Mexico. They're going to come out of three major cities, uh, Tres Zapotes, San Lorenzo, and La Venta. These are going to be where the Olmec stoneheads are found. This is going to be where the first temples, pyramids, tombs are going to be found. The Bonimpak tribe, that was um, a group of Aboriginal people living in the Mexico area. If you go down to Mexico and you look at these murals, you can see the Bonimpak tribe and they clearly have distinctive African features, African nose, lips, hair. We know that there are pyramids and heads in Guatemala, there, Nicaragua, you can go throughout Central America, you can go through Mesoamerica, you can go to South America, as far as Peru, and you can find the presence of African peoples in this area, in the ancient world, not just during the, the movement of Africans during the enslavement process, but these are individuals that are going to be here and establish culture in this part of the world. Evidence of Africans in America, he wrote a book, Frank Joseph. Now this is a man who did not set out to write a book on African presence in America, he just was honest enough to record what he found. He find coins with African heads on them. 
He finds um, vessels that people drank from with African heads. You have a gentleman by the name who was, who was transcended. His name was Alexander von Wutno. When we went to Mexico to study with Dr. Van Sertima in 1984, we went to his museum, his studio. He showed us over 60,000 artifacts that were African in nature. Not just brought from Africa, but built in America, revering Africa. Mansa Musa, who became, uh, what's his name, uh, Montezuma. So Mansa Musa was actually Montezuma, and he was a Mali king who came over here uh, with the flotilla of 200 ships, Abu Bakari II. He sent a flotilla of ships, 200 of them, in, in 1306, and then again in 1311. And together, that constituted 500 ships that sailed here from the west coast of Africa. There was also a map called the Walzemuller map. And this map was considered the first map to have the name America in it. This map was sold to the Library of Congress for like $10 million. When they found the Walzemuller map, Walzemuller said that they basically made the map out of things that were comprised or maps that were comprised and left over by the Egyptians. A lot of people don't know that the state of California was named after a mythological black queen called Queen Khalifa. Now the original California Indians, if you see them, the California Indians clearly look black. The Ohlone Indians, if you see paintings of the Ohlone Indians out of California, you couldn't tell them from an African tribe. If you look at the original paintings of the Mojave Indians, you couldn't tell them from an African tribe. These were clearly dark looking people who had some type of African bloodline. A lot of the founding of America was based on Moorish science. If you see paintings of the inauguration of George Washington, it looked like a Masonic ritual. So again, masonry is based on Moorish science. So they would have these Moorish advisors around them. If you look at old paintings of George Washington, you will see George Washington standing next to a black man with a turban. And remember, when you see the black man with the turban, that's a Moor, that's not a slave. See, people automatically assume that black is slave, but slaves didn't wear no turbans. Because remember, slaves weren't allowed to practice no Islam or any other kind of religion except Christianity. So when you see that turban, that's a black man. And there's a few pictures of George Washington and other people with Moors or black men with turbans standing next to him. When you see that, just know that those are Moors. The Lumbi and the Melungian people, these were an Aboriginal tribe of people who were living in the Americas and they came over and a lot of people act like they don't know where they came from because they were classified as free people of color. And there were other groups called red bones. This is where we get calling a light skinned person a red bone. These are old terms and these people had come over before Columbus. They've been over for a long time. And again, the Melungeons were almost classified as black or Negro, but they called them free people of color. And in some circles, they did classify the Melungeons and the Lumbees as Negro. Abraham Lincoln's mother came from a Melungeon background. And people were very aware of this back then when they were running against Abraham Lincoln in the campaign, his opponents would use that information and try to use it against him. Because remember, back in those days, in order to insult somebody or in order to um, stain somebody's image, you just had to say they were Negro or they were mixed with a Negro or they had a Negro background. And they would do that with Abraham Lincoln. There's old pictures and, and newspapers of Abraham Lincoln dressed up like a Moor. They would call him Abraham Africa Noose. Benjamin Banneker, he was a black man who created the first known almanac. He helped design the city of Washington, D.C. He was a descendant of the Dogon tribe of West Africa, very well versed in astrology. Well, his name itself, he was a Moor also. He was the first one that started the almanac. He was a Moor. In fact, there's a book by Charles Cerami on Benjamin Banneker. In fact, what's interesting about Benjamin Banneker is that they trace his ancestry back to the Dogon people of Mali that what Benjamin Banneker is best known for is his knowledge of agriculture and astronomy. In fact, he was the one that wrote the first Farmer's Almanac. Basically, when you're watching your weather report on the news today and they tell you what, what the temperature was in 1920, that's the Farmer's Almanac. And he was the one that was able to codify, write down um, how to deal with the earth according to the seasons. See, Benjamin Banneker and L'Enfant were building Washington, D.C. And what 
society attempts to tell you is that uh, uh, that Benjamin Banneker had a photographic memory, and he did. Not to take that from the brother. But L'Enfant did not build Washington, D.C. Because whoever built Washington, D.C. had to have been a master astronomer. Because Washington, D.C., as our brother Tony Browder has shown us, is laid out according to the heavens. But not only did he know astrology, but he's, he had a photographic memory. And he studied the plans of the previous architect and knew where everything was in his head and finished Washington, D.C. from his head. Benjamin Banneker also was the first one to really bring the um, clock as we know it today to its highest form. The clock that we use as a watch, okay? Now, a lot of folk are not going to admit this, but what is that big clock called in London? It's called Big Ben. It's named after Benjamin Banneker. But nobody wants to admit this. During slavery, there was something called the Seminole Wars. There were many slave rebellions in this country that a lot of people don't talk about. In the 1800s, there were really a lot of slave rebellions and people were very nervous about what was going on, what had gone on in Haiti because Haiti had, had made themselves independent by having a big slave uprising. There was um, the Nat Turner Rebellion in the early 1800s. People were still shook about that. You had the Denmark Vesey. He was going to have a slave rebellion in South Carolina. That got foiled, but they had up to 9,000 people ready to put in work. So a lot of people were very nervous about slave rebellions in this country. The Seminole War, it was a war of Native American and black people mixed together, calling themselves Seminoles, because there's no such thing as a Seminole Indian. A Seminole Indian, that's, it's, it's a made up term. Um, a Seminole basically means runaway by definition. A lot of black people were fighting for their freedom. The image of black people just sitting around waiting on people to free them, that's a, a, an image to keep us submissive. It was also uh, not economically feasible because of the rebellions that were going on. See, we're not talking about just slavery. We think there was slavery and there was a couple of rebellions like Nat Turner, who, by the way, my wife is uh, descendant of Nat Turner. And they were thinking that that it was just Nat Turner. They were, I mean, they were burning and destroying and there was true guerrilla warfare going on. Ending slavery was not the reason a civil war was fought at all. The civil war was fought to bring the South back into unison with the North and to destroy the economic advantage that the South had had due to slavery. They cared nothing about the lives of black people. They cared nothing about the way that we were treated. They cared nothing about African life. It was not about protecting us because they had somehow waken up and realized that we were human beings too. No, the South was growing too powerful. Capitalism started to rise. But what began to happen was is that in capitalism rising, it began to stifle capitalism because capitalism demands as an economic system that people are always trying to rise to the higher they're competing competition fuels capitalism but if you could buy an african for three hundred dollars and then pay somebody for 20 years three hundred dollars a year which would you do you'd buy someone one time for three hundred dollars but that's going to stifle capitalism because what's going to happen is there's going to be no competition because what European is going to compete for a job that they could buy an African to do? So the North said, look, enslavement of African people is stifling capitalism. And so the South said, so what do you want me to do? They said, well, you got to free your Africans. They free my Africans. Well, how am I going to get my money? The North said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. They said, we don't trust you. No, we're not going to sell our Af we, we are not going to stop enslaving Africans. We're just not going to do it. North said, but you have to because it's going to stifle capitalism and we're going to choke with overproduction without an ability to sell what we're, what, what we're, the South said, but that's not my problem because I can sell my raw materials any place in the world. The North said, but then what would happen to us? We have factories. The South said, well, that sounds like a personal problem to me. I don't care what happens to you. North said, but you can't do that. The South said, we're going to do that. We're not freeing Africans. They said, you've got to free Africa. We're not free. In fact, the South said to the North, you know, I'm tired of talking to you. I'm going to secede. I'm not even going to talk to you no more. In fact, I'm not even part of what your colonies are anymore. I'm going to North said, you can't do that. South said, watch. That started the Civil War. Well, one of the big things that occurred right at the end of the Civil War was that Europeans 
begin to form unions. In fact, the workers' union is an outgrowth of slavery and the Civil War. When it looked like the cause was lost for the Confederacy, white men began to organize themselves into labor forces. Why did they do this? Because you are about to see two million enslaved Africans set free who have skills that equal or supersede your own, who would now be able to compete and buy with you for contracts and livelihood. That was a significant area of concern for white men. Okay, so if I was a, white, a, a European who was looking for work, couldn't find any because it had already been hired up to the slaves of a certain master. So when the Civil War came about and when slavery was about to end, that intensified because now slaves would be aggressively looking for work because when slavery ended, they had nothing to which they could claim their own to make a living. So that bothered Europeans and they set up agreements, okay, with those who had industries and those who had stores that you could only hire someone who was white who belonged to a particular labor's union. In fact, some of the first unions were started right here in Pennsylvania. And a lot of black people fail to realize the origin of the union. The union is nothing but a collective force of white people who are protecting jobs for themselves and keeping them away from black people. The fight came that after slavery ended, we had jobs, which is what you mentioned earlier, that we were starting to get it together because we had skills. It was the white man that didn't have any skills because we're the ones who had been forced to work the black man had. And so part of that destruction, doing all that Jim Crow and everything, was fighting against the brothers who were trying to be in business and who were trying to work. And that fight between the black man and the white man about the construction business has continued down to the day, which is why you can go into a city like Cincinnati and in Philadelphia, where the black population is over 50 or 60 percent, and the white contractors own 99% of all of the jobs in the city. And that's nationwide. That's a, and they've kept us out of it. They've kept us out of the unions. This is what that was. But it was the black man who used to have all of the skills for building. We were the contractors, our people. Abraham Lincoln himself said, if I could keep Africans enslaved and preserve the union, I would do that. Abraham Lincoln didn't want to free African people. He had to because of capitalism, because he saw what was happening. But look at the mean trick. Let's continue the story. Now you have Africans that are free, who are part and parcel of America, who, who deserve not just a break, but they need a little bit more because they deserve, because they built America and made America what it was. So between 1865 and, and 1877, we have what's called the Reconstruction Period, where black folk were going out, going to school, graduating, becoming doctors, lawyers. They were speaking Greek, Latin, better than people who taught Greek and Latin. They were going in, becoming senators, they were becoming Congress people, they were becoming part of the world arena. Europeans got scared, so what did they do? They, they, they started an organization that would attack black folk. It was called the Tea Party, no, not the Tea Party, it was called the Ku Klux Klan, I'm sorry. I, I'm, 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 I'm jumping up in history yet. I, they're gonna start to pass laws where segregation is going to exist because they don't want Africans to be able to take the jobs that are, that are gonna be fueled by capitalism. So what do they do? They said, bring me your weak, your poor, your homeless. Bring me your sick, your ignorant. And that's when the immigration came. And that's who got the jobs that was supposed to go to black folk. A lot of people don't know the original design for the Statue of Liberty was a black female. As a matter of fact, in a museum in New York, you can see the original design of the Statue of Liberty, which is a black woman. When the French artist created the Statue of Liberty, it was supposed to represent the end of slavery. On the original model, there were chains on the hands and feet, as we know. When the statue got to America, they wanted to erase any references to slavery from the statue but the artists really fought to keep the chains on there because this is your art. You don't want people tampering with your art. And if you look, the chain is still on the foot of the Statue of Liberty to this day. Well, the story was that it was a gift of the French to the slaves and that the original statue had the picture of a black woman, uh, the original model for it, and it had a, a distinctly African face. But it was Europeanized because the people in the United States did not want to have a black face sitting up there in the harbor. So they carved it out in France. They had to go back to the drawing board and remodel the face after the 
what they call the um, patron saint of Manifest Destiny. So the patron saint of Manifest Destiny, that's her face on the, um, what do you call it, Statue of Liberty, which was transposed from the African face. In fact, you see the patron saint of Manifest Destiny in the symbol for Columbia Pictures at the beginning of the movies. That's the patron saint of Manifest Destiny. Post-slavery Africans were consolidated. They were more together than ever. Se segregation gave them the necessity or created the necessity for them to maintain a type of co cohesion with each other, no matter if it was infighting. They still had their self-interest and the collective interest. So we didn't know who the enemy was back there. Today, after uh, integration, we don't know who the enemy is anymore. They've changed the history because we seem to be able to do things that other nationalities can't do, and we make it seem easy. We make it seem pretty, and we are arrogant about it, and we have fun with it, and you know, it's just, just a great thing. And they don't want that. They want us to play the game the way that they have set it up to play. It's necessary to destroy a man's mind in order to maintain control of him. If a man knows who he is and continues that into his legacies, to his children, then you have problems controlling that man. Understanding history is one thing, but understanding why the colors were hidden, that's another thing. And the problem is, see, we can't exclude racism, white supremacy. That's the thing we can't escape. A lot of black folks try to avoid talking about it because it makes everybody uncomfortable, but it's a real thing and we have to acknowledge it. A lot of black folks don't really understand racism. And if you don't understand something, you're not gonna be able to effectively deal with it and counter it. Racism, as I understand it, is a global system for the genetic survival of the global white minority population. We usually don't think of whites as being a minority, but they're a tiny minority, fewer than one-tenth of the people on the planet, and they are genetic recessive, meaning that if a black person and a white person mix the president, Barack Obama, you get a colored person. So if you want to maintain an oppressive process on a group of people, you certainly don't inform them of the depths and details of their history. Just like you don't give them adequate education, you don't maintain uh, adequate housing, uh, etc. Every morning that a black person turns on the television, they are getting their dose in indoctrination with white supremacy. You see, so if you turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper, look at a magazine. Unless you understand the system, then you have a grid to put things in their proper perspective. But without that, you are constantly and continuously being indoctrinated by the system itself. You see, but the very fact that people who classify themselves as white would find themselves saying, something's wrong with your genetics, something's wrong with your genetics, in psychiatry, we call that projection. In other words, if I have to keep focusing on your genetics, I must have some doubt about my genetics, and we have the basis for that, meaning, you know, the ability to produce melanin pigment or skin color is a genetically dominant trait. The issue with black people is this. We hate who we are and love who we can be. We hate who we are, Africans, and love who we can be, Europeans. We do not want anybody to remind us of who we are, which is why we shun Africa. We are trying to get out of who we are. And we think that if we act white enough and marry white enough and dye our hair white enough, then maybe white folks will start treating us like white folks. You are an African. White people have never forgotten it, no matter how much you try to, and you will always be treated like an African. It doesn't matter how many doctors you got, it doesn't matter how light you are, it doesn't matter if your wife is white, you can ask Tiger Woods about that, you will still be treated like a black person. And even today, if they don't sanction what you do and authenticate it, then it is considered non-valid. 
And that's unfortunate because that's not true and we can't allow that to be true. And it was the same as with my work and a lot of other people out here. If you have not attended their school and learned their method, whatever they say it is, uh, they have no respect for independent study. When they used to be proud of in America, the self-made man, the self-made woman, that used to be it until it got out of hand and we started creating so many things, you know. William Shockley, who I debated about black genetic inferiority. He was a Nobel Prize laureate. He was one of the inventors of the transistors, a professor at Stanford University. Now he could teach and talk about black genetic inferiority as long as he wanted, but a black person cannot talk about why racism exists and continue to teach at a university level. George Wallace found out, he said when, that's Governor George Wallace, yes. uh, he said when he first went into politics in the South in Alabama, he thought that poor whites, if they would join with blacks, they would have a great deal of political power. You see, and so that coming together of the poor whites and the poor blacks. And he said he soon realized that whites did not care if they didn't have roads, if they didn't have hospitals, if they didn't have schools. They just wanted to know that they were better than the blacks. Now I say that that reasoning comes because the deeper concern was genetic annihilation. You see, in other words, if the poor blacks and poor whites came together and they were working together and functioning together and then they would pretty soon intermix sexually together, then the end result would be white genetic annihilation. Racism definitely took a toll on black male-female relationships, especially in the 1960s, because in the 1960s, black men and black women, they were doing what they were supposed to have done in, for a long time, which was fight together against white supremacy, against racism and they were doing this with the civil rights movement. So what happened, people had to come in and infiltrate and have a divide and conquer um, strategy between black men and black women. In 1964, government came in and they pulled black women to the side and they started to classify black women and women in general as minorities. In 1964, that's the first time they classified women as minorities. So they started to give them set-asides and benefits and then they created the, the feminist movement and a lot of sisters branched off into that and that kind of created a rift because a lot of sisters stopped fighting for civil rights and they started to fight for women's rights but women's rights weren't being jeopardized in the black community our first priority was racism and we should have dealt with that first we wanted to be free we didn't need any boundaries need no man to tell us what to do well we hadn't had no man to tell us what to do anyway you couldn't tell us what to do in slavery so who you know we didn't really have no fight with you about that. That was the white woman's fight with her man, but we took it on. I want to be free. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And then women started having babies, what they call out of wedlock, and then that got to be okay too. Oh, it's all right. Once it got accepted by society, all of the rest of the people, then it was okay then to just have a baby. In fact, I don't even want him for nothing but to just have a baby. And then we started saying, oh, I'm going to be the mother and the father. All kind of nonsense. And so what happened was that movement, and there never was a sisterhood in the women's liberation movement between the black woman and the white woman. Because you have to understand, in the tactic of the art of war, when you want to destroy a stronger enemy, you have to get rid of the, the cultural perspective of uh, authority. So what do you do? You have to destroy the man in the society. And that's exactly what they did. I talk about this in my book. You have to destroy the masculine principle, which is the head of the family. That's part of it. The other part is to get rid of the environment and the ways and means for the head or the authority of that family to become and stay the authority and the head of that family. And that is to be the provider and the protector. Take away his means of providing. Take away his means of protecting his family. And he no longer has any rights or any kind of uh, power. So when you have done that, you have now undermined the glue that keeps a family together. Men don't have to be men anymore. So what's the best thing to do? Since you're giving so many favors to women, I might as well be a woman. 
or at least act like one, and therefore I'm no longer, as Dr. Francis Crest said, I'm no longer a threat. If whites are involved in their genetic survival, and they are threatened by black male masculinity, then it will occur, I have to reduce his masculinity. Yeah, we just recently had the president at Morehouse have to say the male students cannot wear high heel shoes and dresses and carry purses. So something is happening again within the total context of a system of racism, white supremacy. Neely Fuller, who wrote the uh, textbook for victims of racism a number of years ago, in, 19, in the late mid-70s, he used to say in the system, because he was the first person to talk about racism as a system, and he said that as the system of racism, white supremacy moves on, the system is going to have black men wearing dresses. Now, to hear that in the 70s, people said, oh, this is way out. And here we are. You see, there's some black pediatricians who are saying we are developing epidemic levels of the effeminization of young black males. Well, I say the pants hanging it, sagging down, is just a subconscious invitation for homosexuality. You see, it's revealing the buttocks. See, so the pants are getting lower and lower and lower. The next step is to step out of the pants altogether. And so you step out of the pants, you're going to put on a dress. The effeminization is an essential ingredient of white genetic survival. And the only thing that can prevent it is black people becoming conscious or becoming determined that this is not going to happen to them because if the black men are destroyed, then the black people are gone and we have a state of genocide. They always have in the media that black children inherently have lower IQs. They always show these studies of black children's IQs being lower, but what they leave out is that African immigrants, they come over to America and they outperform everybody else academically, including Asians and including whites. Because first of all, IQ is so culture-based. I mean, I mean, IQ doesn't exist. And the evidence of that is just look around you. Because if that's the case, Europeans ain't doing that great either. Because compared to the world, out, out of 166 countries that was tested, the United States of America, European American students, there was only 12 countries did worse than the United States of America. So IQ, it has nothing to do with, that's just, that's a lot of game. First, the concept of IQ, the intelligence quotient comes out of Germany during the rise of Hitler. It was a German white man by the name of Wilhelm Stern who created the intelligence quotient for population extermination reasons. He was later rejected and put out of Hitler's camp, but the IQ is an invention of Nazi Germany. Now, the first IQ test ever used in, a, in the world comes out of France. A European named Alfred Binet, at the request of the French government, was asked to design a test whereby the French government could group or track the students based on how bright they were and identify those who they felt would not be successful in school at all. A white man from New Jersey, Henry H. Goddard, who was a member of the American Eugenics Society, went to France, got a copy of the Binet Scales, first white IQ test brought the Binet scales back to America, made copies of it, and distributed it across the country to white folks everywhere. And Henry H. Goddard himself said that with this tool, we will be able to accomplish our eugenicidal ends. So from the beginning, the IQ test was never meant as an objective standard to see how smart black kids was. It was used to justify access to opportunity, and extermination and racial control. And they're not being taught. Uh, I have a, a, a boy, Hassan, he's 10. And I took him to school and uh, he was at the genius level because I had taught him at home. You know, he was like seven years old. He had an IQ of 153. 
Well, they made sure they dumbed him down, and two years later, he was barely passing. I had to take him, I said, and I fought with him every day. They snatched it. It's like when our children in school are saying that, you know, when somebody's real smart, they say, oh, you acting white. They don't understand that people that look like them invented thinking. In fact, we were thinking before Europeans were even on the planet. Yet we don't notice about ourselves. And because our children are not familiar with this history of themselves, they can't see themselves because they're taught that slaves came from Africa. And so therefore, I'm going to act like a slave because that's who I am. But they don't see themselves as in hotel, or they don't see themselves as Queen Nzinga or Prussia, a second dynasty female doctor, or they don't see themselves as Hypatia a great mathemat uh, mathematic uh, mathematician and medical doctor that was skinned alive by the Romans because they did not want to show an African woman being so intelligent and dragged through the community to show people what, this, what they were going to do to this African woman. Uh, the African man and the African woman's mind does not operate along European paradigmal structures. So if you're teaching him one way, he's going to automatically fail. If the system is structured for him to fail, of course he's going to fail. He's going to say, see, see, I told you. That's ridiculous. We know that genius is definitely and always has been in the African mind because everywhere you go on the planet, you see African genius once left to its own accord. But when manipulated, you could turn him or that genius in her into something that is demonic. Back in 1964. They created a whole other way of teaching your, your son. It was called outcome-based education. It wasn't about you learning math and knowing what math was. A, uh, one and one equals two. Two was the answer. If you got three, you were wrong. But today, if one and one and you said three, you said, oh, you tried. It's all right. Uh, we'll pass you on. That's all right. You, you, you did your best. See, so what they did was in outcome-based education, it became more feminized. It became more of a communal participation in the act or idea of learning, not learning. If you could come together and participate in group things, that showed that you had the ability to be passed on into the new society. If you were a rogue and you jumped out and said, no, I ain't going for this, which is where all the gangs started coming from because most of the males could not deal in an education system that was like this. And this is why you see most of the females getting the PhDs today. Because the system was structured in such a way that took away the challenge that men needed. And it was through the IQ test, which is the number one weapon of special education, which is the number one weapon of special education, they continue to overdiagnose and misdiagnose black children as being mentally retarded who are not. I had a case in Philadelphia this past summer right here some white lawyers asked me to come in and participate in the case. Black boy, eighth grade, diagnosed as mentally retarded. I evaluated the brother, found out he was never mentally retarded. But when I looked into the previous IQ tests that were given, they misinterpreted the data. So this young man been walking around with a diagnosis of mental retardation since he was in eighth grade. He's now a young adult. And although he's been told by me and his parents that you are not retarded and you were never retarded, the self-esteem. The, con the self concept, the self image is so crushed. This brother probably gonna need therapy for the next 20 years because he bought into what? A superficial label that white society has given them. The gifted movement really started to take form right after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. The Supreme Court said you could no longer use race as a factor to segregate groups. But they didn't say you couldn't use disability or ability. So the white folks said, guess what? We're gonna come up with a gifted program we're going to segregate the white kids from the black kids after Brown versus Board because we're going to say the white kids are too smart. It's not based on skin. It's based on ability. Problem with that, it didn't work too well because a lot of white kids didn't score high on the IQ test. So they said, guess what? This is working for some white kids, but it ain't working for all. So guess what? In 1963, the same year that the Civil Rights Bill was introduced, a Chicago psychologist created the learning disability the learning disability. And it is through the IQ test and the learning disability that so many of our children are marshaled into special ed kids where they'll probably never learn to read on grade level by the time they graduate. You see, it's like if I took an animal and put it in a cage and so the animal couldn't grow well. And then I'll say, oh, look at this deformed animal. 
do, do you see I don't say I made this creature deformed because of the conditions that I subjected him or her to and the very fact that in other words the logic in my view if you felt that blacks were genetically inherently inferior you can give them the very best of conditions and they would not be able to perform or function you see but the need to deprive you know at the same time that people are saying oh it's cold outside make sure your dog is in make sure your dog gets all the nutrients for growth and development because you're not fearful that the dog is going to take over the human beings Do you see but once you start depriving systematic deprivation it means well I must be afraid of these people maybe overtaking me if I allow them the same conditions opportunities that I set forth for myself The problem of the 21st century in America is what are we going to do with these 40 million Africans who we do not want here? That is the number one political domestic issue in America. Why? Because AIDS is killing them, but it ain't killing them fast enough. The police are killing them, but they ain't killing them fast enough. The prisons, we are throwing them in there by the dozens every day. But guess what? They still having babies, okay? We're killing the babies on the uh, delivery table, but it ain't getting rid of them fast enough. I was at a meeting last night with a group of parents who have children who are not being successful in high school. And at that meeting, there was a school member who said that she felt in the meeting, we were spending too much time discussing the problems and that we hadn't begun to generate the solutions. And I told her that I disagreed with her and I explained to her why. I said one of the biggest problems we have as African people is that we are too quick to rush out and fix something you know nothing about. If the engine in my car is broke, and I'm not a mechanic, okay, and if I rush out to the car store and buy all types of fancy gadgets to get my engine running again, and I go up under that engine, okay, I can end up wasting those resources, wasting time, Wasting my money and if I'm not careful, I could probably get killed under that hood not knowing what I'm doing I got to be patient. I got to get that manual. I got to read through it I got to study that system. So once I get under that hood, I know exactly what to do when and where Problem with black folk is nobody is patient enough to investigate the problem fully to make sure we understand it So when we go out to fix it, we don't lose any lives unnecessarily any resources unnecessarily, any time or money unnecessarily. Black people have to understand, I had to say first stage, we're not going any place until we understand what we're dealing with. And this is the weakness of our position now. You know, people want to talk about a black agenda with no understanding, no in-depth understanding of what they're dealing with or being afraid to talk about racism, white supremacy as a total system dynamic. So that's step one, to understand what the game is all about. Step two is, I say, the self-respect factor. See, I have to respect myself at a sufficient level to want to push back the force that is attempting to destroy me. I can't want to integrate with it. We don't have a think tank, what is a, something I call a dark matter think tank. These Europeans got think tanks all over the place and that's how they always are 20 steps ahead of us. Because nobody is thinking and strategizing, we're just reacting. And that's why they're keeping us the way we are. We're reactors, you see. We are not supposed to be reactors. We are supposed to be actors, not reactors. We act upon things based upon a consensus thought. When we come together and we know the strategy, it's because all of the greater thinkers came together and threshed out this plan and we knew all of where it's going to fail, where it's not going to fail, how it's going to work, where it will work, where it will not work, and we move from that. We don't have that. That power is the ability to define someone's reality and have that person accept that definition as if it were their own. 
And we have allowed people to define us as to who we are and what we can do. And we have accepted that as if we thought that ourselves. So they don't want us to know how great we are because that's the missing link. If we really knew how great the potential that we have, and that's really all we have left. We have nothing left but our potential. And whenever that potential is able to get free, then we go to the top. They don't keep you out because you're the worst. They keep us out because we are the very best. If we go back to the 1980s, the 1980s, if you remember, there was a lot of focus around whether or not black men had a gene that predisposed them to violence. What's making black men kill other black men? Nobody said anything about slavery, the after effects, self-hate, miseducation, economic castration. Because I can tell you that miseducation and economic castration, that is the lack of jobs, is the mother and father of violence. If you don't educate me properly and you keep me from making a decent livelihood for me and my children, I have no choice but to go to the underworld to feed my family. And in the underworld, I'm likely to come face to face with somebody else who's trying to feed their family at my family's expense. It breeds the violence. And even if you're not selling drugs, the fact that you're walking around knowing as a man that you can not provide for you and yours, which is a natural responsibility, it breeds the anger that we sooner or later let off on one another. And whenever you read a story about a black man killing another black man, they never give you the contextual relevance of what happened. You coming out of store, I'm walking in the store. I bump you accidentally, you turn around and you kill me. On the surface, I just like look like a crazy, angry black man. Nobody's gonna tell you I got fired from a job yesterday for standing up to somebody who called me out my name. Nobody's gonna tell you that I've been putting in job applications for two years consistently, and as soon as they find out that I've been to prison, they drop me from the job. They don't put it in context. 75% of the violence that's taking place out there by black people is economically based and nobody's dealing with it. Half the black men in Philadelphia, unemployed. Half the black men in Baltimore, unemployed. Half the black men in New York City, unemployed. But you don't want to tie that to the rise in violence? Everybody knows when there's, no, when there's never enough jobs in society, violence goes up, even amongst white folk. This is what sociologists study. This is the science of criminology. No jobs, violence. More jobs, less violence. You know this. But when it comes to black people, we don't want to put it in context because we are trying to do what? Exterminate the image. We're trying to get people to see black people as an unnecessary hindrance to the progress of humanity. If you end up with a critical mass of non-white people, all of whom, all over the planet, who have been oppressed by racism, white supremacy, if they begin to understand the white motivation, you see, so they're no longer acting in a way that allows white supremacy to be maintained. Like black people, as long as we're killing each other, destroying ourselves, do you see, or say if you're learning, you're acting white, and so we don't want to do that. These are all dysfunctional behaviors. If we begin to really understand racism, white supremacy, what it is, how it works. It's not a question of, you know, hating white people. That's a waste of energy and a waste of time, but we would no longer be behaving in a way that makes white supremacy comfortable to exist. So we keep talking about, you know, our mantra for over what? 75 years has been, we gotta have unity. We gotta have unity. No, we don't. We don't have to have unity with each other. We just need to get the same idea. And the other thing is that our educators can't decide on what is the history. That's a problem. If you get 10 of them in here in a room, all 10 of them will have a lot of differences about where the civilization started, what we did, who did it and where, okay? White people agree on their history, even if it's a lie, they agree on it. Patrick Henry, they agree on that, you know, Marco Polo, whoever it is, they agree, yep, that's what he did. Yep, that's what he did. They don't have a, a, a argument about what the truth is. They just came together, decided on what the history is gonna be, and then that's what they accepted, and that's what they teach their children, and that's what they teach our children. And now what's, now instead of Ku Klux Klan, who do we have? We have the Tea Party. Because the Tea Party are the children of the immigrants that were brought here for those jobs. But as long as they did their jobs, it was all right. But now what are they doing? They are now outsourcing the jobs to India and to China, to South America. And now who's losing their jobs? Who's losing their homes? It's those poor, 
huddled masses that were brought here to Ellis Island. It's out, it's in source, outsource. And peoples of European descent never realized what the real problem was. Because they were ignorant enough to believe that it was black folk. White folk are in worse position because even black folk that got the job in McDonald's, got the job as custodians, they have a job now. It's those other ones that were given those middle management positions that have lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their car, lost their way. Quite frankly, from what I'm hearing them say, they done lost their minds. And so we have men who don't have the discipline to withstand the onslaught of the sexual energy that our women now carry. Most of our women don't get along with a black man unless he laying down. Once y'all stand up, we going back to fighting. But we get along with you in the bed. And I tell them, I say, we have to learn how to get along with our man more than just in the bed. And there has never been a civilization where the children grew up to be successful when the man and the woman were at odds with each other, like the black man and black woman in, in America, okay? The fact that we can't get along is demonstrative by the situation, the uh, condition of our children, especially our daughters. Our, our sons are acting like daughters, okay? They're not gay, they just have the feminine emotional mechanism because they've been around too many women, they've been raised by women and heard so much negative things about a black man, about being a black father. Food, clothing, and shelter. Until you get food, clothing, and shelter, you will never get the attention of the masses. What made Marcus Garvey so successful? What made the Honorable Elijah Muhammad so successful? What made the Black Panther Party so successful? Now you're looking at three different ideologies. Mr. Garvey's Pan-Africanism. Elijah Muhammad's black religious nationalism. The black socialism of the Black Panther Party. Ideologically, they were different. But all three of them did one thing. Provided for food, clothing, shelter, jobs, education, medical care. Every last one of those institutions attempted to build some sort of an independent functioning community with services. We ain't doing that today. We ain't doing that today. And that's why we don't have their attention. They say, why does the church continue to control black people when all they do is sell Jesus and collect money? Why? Because the church does have some services. It ain't sufficient, but they got more than the conscious organizations. The problem with the conscious organizations is all we do is run our damn mouth, but nobody's building. You follow me? We got a million and one books at the bookstore. We got a book for every problem, but the problems are still here. See, we have been content with the information. The information is not enough. It is information plus actions. That our schools teach our children the truth, okay? And we could do that because we pay for the schools. Public education is not free in that way. We pay for it every day, every time we pay taxes, every time we purchase things, every time we buy insurance, whatever it is, we're supporting all these things. And we have more say so there, but it's difficult to get us to come out to the schools. And the frustration of having children who are out of control is so high that the mothers are glad to send the child off to school and try to give that responsibility to somebody else instead of us taking that responsibility on ourselves.